But what Jesus did was, was not put an end to Judaism. Jesus did not come to, to end the covenant God had made with the Jews. Jesus came to open it so that we could be the adopted brothers and sisters to the first covenant. We're children of the new covenant in God. Sometimes when we break bread, we celebrate communion, and I, I lift up the cup and I say, uh, the cup of the new covenant. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this new covenant that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world to open that circle so that we could enter it. I, I have a friend, he's a Zionist. Well, actually, we're, we're more like theological debaters. I wouldn't call us friends so much. He's, he's a Zionist. He believes that the Messiah hasn't come and the Messiah won't come until all the Jews are gathered together in uh, Israel. And then the Messiah will come. And I say, well, look, Max, um, I believe the Messiah has come. And I believe now that I am your adopted brother in faith because of Jesus Christ. And he says, well, why don't you practice Torah? Why don't you practice the law? I said, well, we do, we do have the Old Testament, the First Testament. He says, yeah, but why don't you practice it? I said, I don't need to. You see, I'm, I'm a child of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. My relationship with God isn't based on a law. My relationship with God is based on a life, a love that opened the covenant and gave me access. Oh, he didn't like hearing that. Just the same way the people at the time of Jesus Christ didn't like hear, hearing about him stepping outside of the circle either. You see, they had control. They, they controlled the circle. They kept it closed pretty tight. God gave them a, a covenant and they held on to it pretty tightly. They didn't need this Galilean coming along and, and opening up the circle to welcome others in. Jesus, as you know, was tried and convicted as a political criminal for treason. Jesus uh, opened people's minds and hearts in such a way that it threatened those who who hung on to the circle, those who divided the camps. There were incredible justice and political implications to what Jesus did. If there wasn't, he would not have been crucified. There were also social implications to what Jesus did. You see, when he opened that circle, when he stepped outside of the circle to call in and welcome in the Gentile world, he opened the circle to you and me. In spite of our sin, in spite of our brokenness, in spite of what we've done, what we've said, what we left, have left undone, in spite of who we are, in spite, in spite of our ethnicity, in spite of our, our language, in spite of our creed, Jesus opened the circle to every one of us. Now, I know there's some of you, and you worship every week, and I'm very thankful you do, but even in your hearts, you live long enough in this world, you start to to take a disliking to yourself sometimes, right? You, you've said things. You didn't mean to, but you did. You've done things you didn't mean to, but, but you did. Or, or you should have done, you know, I should have done this, or I wish I'd done that, I wish I hadn't done that. The fact of the matter is because Jesus opened the circle, you're welcome into the grace of God. You get a new start. You get a do-over with your life. That's the social implication of what Jesus has done. That's why we're, we're here today. You know, there was a time in my life, I might have been 17 or 18 years of age, I really didn't like who I was. I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure my parents didn't like who I was much either, but thankfully they loved me anyway. You see, I was, I was a, a product of those experimental 70s. I was also the third son of a very well-known preacher in our city, my father. And I tried my darndest to prove to everybody I was not a holier-than-thou different kid because my dad was a preacher. You see, I'd go out with friends and they'd say, oh, you can't drink around him, his dad's a preacher. You can't smoke around him, his dad's a preacher. You, you can't cuss around him because his dad's a preacher. You can't do this, you can't do that because his dad's a preacher. Well, I was such a knucklehead, do you know what I did to try and prove to them that I was normal and you could do those things around me? I did everything my friends were doing, only I did it more. I went over the tops, trying so hard to prove that I was normal, I actually became abnormal. I was the cliche, the typical rebellious preacher's kid. How sad was that? I didn't like myself very much. But I was trying so hard to fit into everyone else's circle, I didn't know how to be myself. But you know, thank goodness, 
Thank God for the church. You see, the church continued to reach out to me. I, I, I went every week. I had to. And, and it was in our house, that was the rule. You grew up in this house, you go to church every Sunday. Doesn't matter what you were doing on Saturday night. In fact, because of what you were doing on Saturday night, you need to be in church on a Sunday morning. Now the little known secret at the time in our house that my brothers and I have talked about ever since was we loved being in church. We felt great being at church. And the people in the church continued to welcome us in spite of ourselves. And I'd come in wearing an army jacket, ripped up jeans and a headband, trying my darndest to offend the very people who cared about me and trying to prove to the, the people outside of the church that I was somehow like them. Now there might have been a few heads that turned and thought, ah, what kind of preacher would allow his kid to show up at church looking like that? Missing the obvious that I was showing up at church. The majority of the people in that congregation continued to welcome me, to encourage me, to nurture me, to, to cheer me on, saying, Mark, you, you're going you're gonna to get there, you're going to get there. And whenever there was a special in, event in the church, they kept inviting me, including me. And I kept thinking to myself, if these people really knew who I was, they would never invite me. They wouldn't want me around. But after enough in invites, enough of having me there, I discovered that they really did know me. And they welcomed me anyway. In spite of myself, they welcomed me. And I think that's when my call to be a pastor awakened. When I started to learn about this God who welcomes us unconditionally and the people who follow him faithfully are the people of grace who live in an open circle. That's why I love being at Old Stone Church. You heard the letter of James talking about those we accept and those we don't. If we accept and only those who are dressed nicely, the wealthy, and ignore the poor and those who don't dress as nicely, then our, our faith is a sham. But here at Old Stone, everybody is welcome in this circle. A true reflection of the amazing grace of God. Everyone is welcome. Now, I don't know about you, there was another song we sang as kids. We didn't get to sing it in public school. They, they kind of squeezed that out, unfortunately, when I was growing up. But, but uh, we sang it at church, and we sang it in Sunday school. And Last week, I asked you to sing uh, Sanctuary with me uh, at the end of the sermon, and three of you did. Thanks. Um, but, but you didn't know the song so well, but you know this one, and I want you to sing it with me, because it reminds me that we have all been included in the circle of God's grace through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior. And the song goes like this. He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole wide world in His hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. If we can let that dwell in our hearts today and in this week ahead, if we can remember that Christ came in this world not to destroy a covenant, but to create a new one, to open the circle of God's grace, not just to the Jews, but to the entire world, that who would ever turn to Jesus Christ and follow him would have total, unlimited access to the amazing grace of God. Praise be to God. Amen.